Hello fellow Tsarnist! And welcome to this new series where we'll be taking a look at a few fun builds that I've been trying. Most build guides are about min-maxed, overpowered builds that trivialize the entire game with overpowered abilities. But here instead we're trying to make builds that fulfill a certain role-playing fantasy. To fit a strong theme, creating a more unique and dynamic playstyle that feels more fully fleshed out. With each build having a gimmick to master, with many options to use in combat, not just spam one move to win. And most importantly, I want my builds to look absolutely stunning. This first build is for all the Bloodborne fans out there, especially if you liked using the Beast transformation in that game. Because here we'll be making use of the Beast Claw weapon from the DLC, and of course Melania's Great Rune, which gives us time to recover lost health if we attack an enemy right after getting hit. I've always wanted to make a build using Melania's Great Rune, but it never made much sense, because it used to nerf your health flasks very severely. Not to mention that you acquire it very late in the game, which by then you don't have much left to do. Fortunately, the DLC lessened the flask nerf, added an entire game's worth of content, and them just adding the beast claws from Bloodborne is the icing on the cake. Also, the rune gives us this blood trail thing, which looks mwah, so good. For the look, we have a somewhat traditional gothic vampire look, using the full Ants back set, except for the helmet, where I'm using the Confessor Rogue instead. This outfit is super light, so it makes a slight roll, which makes it a very agile character. For talismans, we're using the Lord of Blood's Exaltation, which gives us a 20% damage buff when we bleed an enemy, which we'll be doing a lot of. The Rotten Winged Sword Insignia, which boosts consecutive attacks. The Godskin Swaddling Cloth, which restores health with successive attacks. And I also like to use the Viridian Amber Medal plus three because this is a very stamina hungry build but if you can manage without it use the medicine burst thesis instead for even more damage on our left hand we have the beast claw mentioned earlier but on our right hand we have the reduvia dagger we're using reduvia because it gives us a strong projectile attack it causes very good bleed build up bleed triggers our lord of blood's exaltation buff and the laban art is boosted by the anspach set which makes it even more powerful the idea is to buff yourself using reduvia and then two hand your beast claws the claws are a very quick and agile weapon making them ideal for a life seal build such as this. They also have what I think is the best feint attack in the entire game. If you don't know, feint attacks are when you hold a heavy attack and then press the dodge button to attack while dodging backwards. Not all weapons have this, but the ones that do usually cover a very small distance with a dodge, making them not very useful. But this one actually covers a very long distance, and so it's much more useful and can lead into some of the sickest gameplay moments if you use it correctly. For Raven Arts, we have two options. One is Savage Claws, which is this series of slashing attacks. They deal good bleed build up and they just demolish smaller enemies and even Melania. It synergizes very well with our build because we attack 6 times in quick succession. This is the best weapon art for this build, and it's the one I use most often. But not all bosses have big enough openings for it, which is why we have option 2, Raging Beast. This is one of the most fun skills in the entire game for me. You get this directional dodge, followed up by a very long leap towards your enemies. You can learn to time this to so many boss attacks, and it's just so rewarding because you get to keep the aggression. This weapon art has a follow-up attack, but it's too slow in my opinion. I actually don't switch between these two Ashes of War on a single weapon. Instead, I just keep two Beast Claws on my left hand slot, and I like to switch between them at 5, and we actually have enough endurance to do that and still light roll. Our stat distribution also allows us to cast blood incantations very effectively with the dragon communion seal, and this just gives this build a bit more versatility to make it more fun. We can also cast golden vow and frame get more strength for more damage and defense. We can use the blade of Ansbach, which is not very useful but it's very elegant and fun to use. We can even use dragon spells, but the most fitting one is the dragon claw, because it really does look like an enlarged vampire claw. This is the character sheet for this build, feel free to pause if you like. Up next, we have my Sorcerer Duelist build. This build turns the game and especially magic duels into this constant back and forth of you casting your own spells and deflecting an enemy's attack or spell and just giving it right back to them, on the off chance that they too can reflect spells. It might even just turn into a tense match. For the look, I have this look you might have seen me use in a couple of videos. This is my favorite sorcerer look in the game. I'm wearing the altered version of the Arabic robe, the Perceptor's trousers, and the High Priest gloves. This outfit gives us no gameplay bonuses, but it looks cool and lets us fight roll. For talismans, we have the Child of Alexander, which boosts our weapon art damage. More on that later. The Graven Mass talisman, which boosts our sorcery damage. The Magic Scorpion charm, which boosts our magic damage. And the Godfrey icon, 
which boosts charge spells. For weapons, of course, we're using the Shield of Night, which is a small shield that gets a projectile weapon art that gets powered up if you use it right after blocking an attack. The reason we're using the Shield of Night instead of Carry on Retaliation is that, besides it being more fun of course, it actually does scale with our dexterity, and it scales very decently too, so you can actually get much more damage out of it. It's also a much faster response to an attack, you can do it multiple times in a row, and the coolest thing is that it works for every blockable attack, and not just spells. The weapon skill is not considered a guard counter, but it is a weapon art, so it is boosted by the Shard of Alexander, uh, and it does deal magic damage. So it will be also boosted by things like the Magic Scorpion Charm, the Magic Shroud and Crack Tear, and the Terra Magica. Now, this being a small shield, we face a bit of a problem. We get very little stability on our blocks, and we get tons of chip damage. Which is why we're pairing this with the Deflecting Heart tier, which makes it so that timing your blocks makes them consume much less stamina, have 100% physical defense, and much higher elemental defense too. Having to time our blocks introduces this new dynamic risk reward system, where you are rewarded for timing your blocks correctly by not taking any damage and then getting to retaliate. But the punishment for not doing it is a bit harsh, and that's why we're also pairing this with the Scholar Shield, which reduces stamina consumption and increases our physical and magic defenses while blocking at 65 intelligence, which is what we have for this belt. The best staff to use is the Academy Glenstone staff. For what spells to use, you get a very vast amount of choice here. You can't go too wrong with these, but here's the direction I'm going for. Since the Shield of Night deals a very decent amount of stance damage, I'm going for a stance breaking belt, using tons of charged spells that deal heavy stance damage. So we're using spells like Glint Blade Trail and Glintstone Nails. Both of which deal tons of stance damage and are also boosted by the Godfrey icon when you charge them. I'm also using Great Blade Phalanx, which deals some very heavy stance damage. The great thing about these spells is that you can easily set them up to hit in quick succession, dealing massive stance damage. To repost, we are using the Magic Infused Misericord to take full advantage of our stance breaks. You can use any Ash 4 you want with it, but I recommend Carrion Sovereignty, which is a bit slow but deals massive amounts of damage and a huge amount of stance damage as well. So it goes well with our build. I think the Shield of Night synergizes well with such an aggressive build because it deals okay stance damage and is very fast as well. For a single use spell, I'd use the fingernail spell. It's a very FP efficient spell and we don't have too much FP here because of our stat distribution, so this works for us. This is the character sheet for this build. This is a very stat hungry build, so I highly recommend using the Godric Great Rune. For our third build, there is my Earthblender build. This build makes use of the Golem Fists, which is a smith script weapon meaning it gets those projectiles on a heavy attack. When you're relatively close to your enemies, the projectiles deal very decent damage. If you manage to hit both the melee and the ranged part of your heavy attack, you get even higher damage, the highest heavy attack damage of any fast weapon in fact. But it consumes much more stamina. The projectiles are super useful for finishing off a low health enemy from a safe distance, or maintaining stance damage, or voice breaking an enemy that you've already done heavy stance damage to before they recover. Since this is a strength belt, we're using the Claw Mark Seal to cast bestial incantations, mainly the Stone of Grank, which deals some very hefty amounts of voice damage from a very large distance. We are pairing this build with the Deflecting Heart tier, which we're not really building around, but you don't need to build around the Deflecting Heart tier for it to be good. The Deflecting Heart tier, of course, lets us deflect with our weapon. I think this really fits the theme of us being an earthbender, you know, blocking with the stone gloves. There are two ashes of war that I switch between. One is Horalu's Earthshaker. This is the one that thematically fits this build the most. You deal good damage in an AoE. It's cool for clearing trash mobs and such, but it's way too slow to use against most bosses. And so for them, I switch to the Shriek of Sorrow, which gives us a 10% damage boost by default, but the amount is increased when your health is low. The best part about this skill is that you don't need to stay at low health to keep the buff. You can just use the skill and then heal after, and you'll keep the larger buff. Hey, uh, future Clanky here. Don't use either of these weapon arts. Instead, wear heavy, but still sexy. Armor, stack defense buffs, and then use endure and just tank everything like a chad. I honestly don't like this alternative blade style too much, but it fits the theme so well that I had to include it. Now back to the rest of the video. Huh, that was weird. Now where was I? Ah, right. For talismans, I used the smithing talisman for increased projectile damage on our heavy attacks. The axe talisman to increase the damage on both the projectiles and the melee part of the heavy attack. Bear that with a spiked crack tier for an even bigger increase in heavy attack damage. We also use the two-headed turtle talisman for better stamina recovery and the bleed of mercy, which gives us a large damage boost when we repost an enemy, which we'll be doing a decent amount of since we're a heavy attack build. Feel free to swap either of the physic tiers we're using to the stone barb crack tier to stance break enemies more easily. And for the look, we have the altered version of the dry leaf robe, the dry leaf arm wraps, and the mesmer solder greaves. This is the full character sheet for this build.
For our next build today, we have a kicking Valkyrie build. Barcelona are fully inspired by the Valkyries in God of War. The point of this build is to jump kick everything to death. That's it, really. For the look, we have the Divine Bird Warrior Greaves, which boosts our kicking attacks by 4%. Now, this is where I got the idea for this build, actually. At first, I thought 4% would never be worth not having pants. But then I thought, huh, why not try to make this work? I think I did an okay job. For the chest piece, we have the Gravebird's Blackwell Armor, which is one of the best looking armor pieces in the entire game. It gives us the school black wings and it boosts our jump attack damage. And to complete the look, we have Melania's helmet and the Guardian braces. Our main weapon of choice is of course Dane's footwork. Most of our attacks with it are kicks, which synergize well with our armor and talisman choices. But what you really want to go for is jump heavy attacks. To really take advantage of this build, this is a faith build by the way. And so we are infusing our weapon with either Holy or Flame Art. For talismans, we have the Rotten Winged Sword Insignia, which boosts successive attacks, the Shattered Stone Talisman, which boosts our kicking attacks, the Claw Talisman, which boosts zombing attacks, and the Viridian Amber Medallion Bust 3, which boosts our stamina, because this is a very stamina hungry build. The Dry Leaf Whirlwind is our Ash 4th choice. It doesn't synergize with the jump attack boosting items, but it is a bunch of kicks, so it gets boosted by the other items that we have, and it activates the Rotten Winged Sword Insignia. Onto why this is a faith build. Besides us getting access to a myriad of spells, we actually get more AR than we would have if we went for Dex or Strength belt, uh, and we're much more versatile with the types of damage that we're dealing, since we can infuse with either Flame Art or Holy, depending on the situation, and our Robin Art is fully dependent on AR instead of scaling with a specific stat, so there are no drawbacks to doing this. The best seal to use for this belt is the R3 seal, since we do have 70 faith, and for spells you can really use just whatever you want. I recommend using the Golden Vow and Flame Grant Me Strength. For more damage and defense, for offensive spells, Divine Bird Feathers come to mind as something that would complement the look of this belt, but sadly it sucks, so don't touch it. You may have noticed that I have a weapon on my back, and this is a Holy Infused My Lady. It's a weapon with a very elegant moveset that really fights a Valkyrie. But I'm mostly using it for the looks, since it does look great on our character. We're not really building around it, but you can always just use the Deflecting Heart tier and instantly make it a good weapon to use. But the real reason we're using it is to use the Aspect of the Crucible Wings to really complete the Valkyrie look. We get to have 4 wings when we use it, we look really cool in my opinion. The skill itself is fine, it's a good option for closing in the distance to enemies, it's it's fun too. For Physic tiers, we're using either the Holy Shrouding Crack tier or the Flame Shrouding Crack tier, depending on what infusion we're using. and the Crack tier for more damage with consecutive attacks. Overall, this is a very powerful build. The kicking jump attacks are some of the most fun and powerful in the game to begin with, but we're using so many things to buff that specific attack, so this is really good. Much of the footage that you're seeing for this specific build is from before 1.14, and FromSoft buffed this weapon in 1.14, so you'll get even better performance. And this is the full character sheet for this build. Next up is my Helic 3 Assassin build. You know how some bosses in Elden Ring have that thing where an attack takes super long to do, or how some combos have delayed attack in the middle of them? Well, this build is about attacking these bosses during these delays. The idea for this build came to me when I wanted to take advantage of the retaliatory cross tree talisman, which buffs rolling and backstab attacks, and I immediately thought of using dual daggers paired with a fine crucible feather talisman. The daggers cover a very large distance with their backstab attacks and deals piercing damage, which gives you a large damage bonus if you attack an enemy during their attack animation. And I use the Spear Talisman for more damage for attacks like this. And I would use the Fine Crucible Feather Talisman, which gives us iframes on our back steps, so we can use that attack more safely. But it turns out that you can do the same attack using the Quick Step Ash 4, and the Retaliatory Talisman would still buff it. So we're using Quick Step instead, because it's much easier to use and is much more reliable. Quick Step is much better for this build than Blood Hound Step, because the smaller distance of the dodge actually lets us close the distance and retaliate faster. The quick step is also much more circular in its motion compared to the blood on step, which is more of a straight line. You can use quick step to circle around your enemies and attack them from a vulnerable spot, and you're more likely to get piercing damage bonus that way. The backstab attack hits twice, and we try to use it as often as we can, so we're using talismans that buff consecutive attacks like Melisand Prosthesis and the Rotten Winged Sword Insignia. We're also using the Thorny Crack tier for more damage with consecutive attacks. The daggers I use are the Earth Steel daggers. They're straight up the best daggers for melee damage in the entire game. They get good faith scaling even with physical damage, so we get good physical damage in addition to our chosen affinity, despite not investing much in any other stat besides faith. Like the previous build, we switch between Holy and Fire affinities, depending on the encounter. 
and we also switch between Holy Shroud and Cracktear and the Fire Shroud and Cracktear. They also get this heavy attack where you slash twice, it gets some very decent damage. It's also very fast, this is sort of than your normal light attack combo, so it will be your bread and butter outside counter attacks. We have 65 faith for this build, and for that level the best seal to use is the God Slayer seal. For what spells to use, you'll be using the Golden Vow and Flame Grant Me Strength for defense and damage and whatever else spells that you like. For the looks, this is what I went for. This outfit lets us light roll, and Leather's Armor gives us 10% damage buff to rolling and running attacks, so it's a decent buff to our belt. This is definitely the hardest belt to play so far. You need to learn the boss patterns really well to be good with it, but it's worth it in my opinion because of just how fun this playstyle is. And this is the full character sheet for this belt. For our next belt today, we have the Grave Warden belt. This is not actually a Grave Warden, but I just call him that because his look is inspired by the Grave Warden from Elden Ring and the Grave Warden from Dark Souls 2. The point of this belt is to use the Poisoned Hand, which has this weapon art that poisons most enemies and some bosses almost instantly. The Poisoned Hand also gives us a good damage buff when we poison an enemy, even if we're two-handing another weapon. The Poisoned Hand is literally flayed skin that you wear, and so I try to make the character's skin color match the skin from the weapon. Here are the color settings for that, I think I got pretty close. This is the outfit we are wearing, and you guessed it, this lets us light roll. After we poison an enemy with the poisoned hand, we immediately switch to our real main weapon, which is the occult infused venomous fang. We're using the occult affinity because it makes our physical damage scale with arcane, and the difference in poison buildup between the occult affinity and the poison affinity on this weapon is negligible at best. The poisoned hand also scales with arcane, so we're getting physical damage, stats build up, and good damage on our secondary weapon, all by investing in one stat, which is just amazing. Our Ash Fourth choice is the Poison Flower Blooms Twice, which deals massive damage to poisoned enemies and actually removes the poison effect, making them susceptible to being poisoned again. So again, the idea is to poison an enemy with the poisoned hand, getting a huge damage buff from it and the Candid Frost Exaltation, switch to the Venomous Fang, nuke the living hell out of our enemy, then just continue the cycle over and over again. The Venomous Fangs need no introduction, they're one of the best weapons in the game by far, they're super fast, they hit like a truck. They have obscenely high stats effect buildup, and they even inflict deadly poison instead of regular poison. Just a great weapon all around. For talismans to use, obviously we have the Kindred of Rots Exaltation, which buffs our damage when we poison an enemy, we mentioned that earlier. The Rotten Winged Sword Insignia, and Millicent Burst Thesis to buff consecutive attacks. And the Shard of Alexander, to boost our weapon art damage. This already is a very powerful build, because of just how many damage buffs we're getting by just fighting our enemies. But it gets even more insane. Since this is an arcane belt, we get very high scaling with the Dragon Communion Seal. We use it to buff ourselves with Flame Guard Me Strength and Golden Vow to get more damage and defense. But we also get very high damage with any other incantations that we want to use, especially the Dragon spells. And this is the character sheet for this belt. Next is my Horn Synth Noble belt. This build is all about using the Falx, which is one of my favorite DLC weapons. The Falx is a pair of two curved swords, and that means it gets the best power stacking moveset in the entire game. There is not a single move here that is bad. All your attacks hit with both weapons at once and come out really fast. The Falx has bleed build up and both the running attack and jumping attack hit four times in a row, which makes them build up bleed pretty quickly and also synergize greatly with the talismans that we're using, which are the Rotten Winged Sword Insignia and the Medicine Burst Thesis for more consecutive attack damage, the Lord of Blood's Exaltation for a 20% damage buff when you block lead and the Shard of Alexander, which boosts our weapon art. Speaking of weapon arts, the one the Falx has is disgusting. Hold the scale button to run very quickly to catch up to your enemies, and then let go to slash with both weapons, dealing some really good damage. But then of course, if you have a big enough attack window, you follow up with another input to let out this insane flurry of attacks that build up bleed and also trigger our consecutive attack talismans, giving you a huge damage buff, and then ending with a very powerful double slash attack to make full use of all the damage that we've accumulated. This already is a very powerful build, but of course this is not enough for this series, and that's why I'm also using the Smith script dagger. The effectiveness of this build relies on us building a bleed and consecutive attack damage, but some bosses like to create distance between them and you by doing some large AoE attacks or dodging away, completely killing your momentum. But it doesn't have to be that way, because then we switch to our blood infused Smith script dagger and throw a dagger or two at them from a distance. Your light and heavy throws will maintain pressure on the bosses by adding to your consecutive attack boost. They also continue building up bleed and also prevent the bosses from regenerating their stance damage. Some bosses get too far however, and for that we use the webinar piercing throw, which travels a much further distance and deals more damage. However, it doesn't help us maintain our consecutive attack bonus, so it's a bit of a trade-off really. Our stat distribution allows us to use golden vow and flame guard me strength for more damage and defense. The curse blade mask gives us 5 more dexterity, which is our main damage stat. We're also getting 5 more dexterity 
variety from the Melis and Bros pieces, so that's them. And that's why we're able to have 60 vigor, 40 endurance, add enough faith to cast Golden Foul and Flame Gun Miss Tank. The Fax is a horn synth weapon, and so I leaned hard into the horn synth aesthetic for the look. I used the Curse Blade Mask, the high beige clothes and trousers, and the Spell Blades gloves. And no wonder people hate the horn synth if that's how they fight. This is by far the most powerful belt so far in the series. It's not even close, really. And this is the character sheet for this belt. I'll be honest with you, this belt is just my take on a Godskin Apostle cosplay. If you watch other belt videos, you probably saw other belts like this. And it doesn't really help that the DLC didn't add any new Black Flame incantations. But I have this here for two reasons. First is the look, which I had to include in this series. I really do think we look amazing here. I used the Godskin Apostle hood, the Black Flame monk gauntlets, the gold mask rags, and the Nox Greaves. These are all pieces from different sets, and they should never fit together. And yet they do, and that's why I love Elden Blink so much. And second is to say that although it is true that the damage over time property of the Black Flame spells is nerfed in the DLC, it really just doesn't fucking matter when your damage is that high. So don't feel discouraged to use them. Our Robin of choice is of course the Flame Art Infused God Skin Peeler, which is a twin blade. And our Robin Art of choice is of course the Black Flame Tornado, which is one of the most destructive Ashes of War out there. Smaller enemies and Melania have no chance to fight against it, and although it takes a long time to cast, it's really satisfying to find a window for it, and to get it right, you can also charge it for more damage. Our seal of choice is the Godslayer seal, and this is by far one of the best seals in the game, and although it gets slightly less scaling than the Earth 3 seal at our level, it still boosts our Black Flame spells by 10%, making it just more useful for us. The Black Flame spells are really powerful, they get this damage over time effect, which is really good against enemies with larger health bars, at least outside the DLC. The Black Flame spell is a good source of consistent high damage, and it has good range, and you can also charge it for more damage. Scouring Black Flame has less range, but it is better for larger enemies and groups of enemies. Black Flame Ritual is fun, but uh, I, I think it's a bit useless. And Black Flame's protection should not be ignored as a defensive option. 35 physical damage negation is pretty good, despite the flask nerf. Especially if you stack other defensive options with it, like Golden Valve, the Dragon Crest Great Shield, and the Obline Heart Tier. However, it doesn't stack with Flame Guide Me Strength, and that spell boosts both your fire and physical damage. So I have to choose between attack and defense here. For talismans, we use the Shard of Alexander for more Robin Art damage, the Rotten Winged Sword Insignia for more damage with consecutive attacks, the Fire Scorpion Charm which boosts fire damage. However, it does nerf our defense, so consider replacing it with a defensive talisman or the Flux Canvas. And finally, we use the Godfrey Icon, which boosts charged spells and Robin Arts, which is great for us because our Robin Art and all of our spells are chargeable. And for the Physic, I use the Flame Shrouding Crack Tier and the Thorny Crack Tier, which boosts consecutive attacks. Feel free to swap that one to the Deflecting Heart Tier instead. And this is the character sheet for the spell. This belt is my take on a DRAKE WARRIOR belt. And I have to say that I'm really proud of how this one looks. We look like an Elden Ring version of a Final Fantasy Dragoon. I use the Drake Knight armor, the Banished Knight helm, the Drake Knight gauntlets, and the Fire Knight greaves. This is my favorite look on this series so far. There are a million ways to play a Dragon Communion build, but the way I like to play this is to start a fight by stacking damage buffs, stance break an enemy, and then casting Bale's Flame Lightning to deal tremendous amounts of damage. Now let's break that down. We already use spells like Golden Vow and Flame Guide Mistrack for more damage, but we can go much further with buffs in the fight itself. We can cast Grail's Roar to nerf an enemy's defense and attack damage for 60 seconds. We can build up damage buffs from consecutive attacks with the Rotten Ring Sword Insignia, the Malice and Prosthesis, and the Thorny Crack Tear, and then we stance break an enemy, and reposting them gives an additional 20% damage boost from the Blade of Mercy Talisman, and then we just nuke our enemies with Bale's Flame Lightning. Bale's Flame Lightning has a really good high bar armor, so you can actually tank a hit or two and still hit your enemy. Our weapon of choice is the Flame Art Infused Queen Lines Greatsword. This weapon looks extremely cool. This is probably one of my favorite weapon designs ever. It's a heavy thrusting sword with the best range in class. It's fast and deals piercing damage, so you can be very aggressive with it, which is great for our build. This is a very stat hungry build, and since Melisand's Prosthesis gives us 5 dexterity and Queen Lines Greatsword requires 18 in order to use, we actually have 13 base dexterity. 30, and the talisman brings us up to that level. Also, can we talk about how cool the one-handed heavy attack looks? I know it's just a thrust, but oh my god. Our Robin out of choice is the repeating thrust for its ability to build up our consecutive attack buffs. Other options I like are the flame spear and flame skewer, but we're sticking with this one for now. For our last talisman, we are using the flux canvas talisman, which buffs all of our incantations by 8%. We also use the flame shrouded crack tier for more fire damage. And for the seal, we of course use the dragon communion seal, and we also use a bunch of other dragon incantations with it. We get access to many damage types with these spells, so we can actually deal with a lot of bosses that are strong to fire. For these bosses, I recommend using Borealis's Mist to inflict frostbite and lower their defenses, and then follow up with Dragon Maw to deal massive damage. Dragon Maw is faster than Bale's Flame Lightning, but it deals less damage. And so I only use it against bosses that are strong against fire, like Mog and Mesmer. Another spell that I like to use would be Bale's Tyranny, which is another spell that deals heavy damage. 
but this one is more effective against groups and such. Although you can only have Bill Stelny and Flame Lightning on NG+, and I honestly prefer Flame Lightning, but if you're already on NG+, then why not use both? This build is very versatile in general. You can use other spells like Knight's Lightning Spear, or Mesmer's Orb. And even bless with this extra ruin to flex on Bale. We even have access to Ancient Dragon's Lightning Strike, which is one of the best spells in the entire game. Go wild is what I'm saying with this build. And this is the character sheet for this build. Hey everyone, if you made it this far, thanks a lot for the view. This video is a compilation of the first three videos in the series. I thought it was a good idea to give these videos another chance with the algorithm, to potentially get more eyes on the series. I also made a few minor changes, including better stat distributions for the first build, as suggested by one of my subscribers. Now tell me which build was your favorite, subscribe if you want to see more videos like these, leave a comment for the algorithm, or give me any feedback that you have, and uh, bye bye